All right, went a little long on the last one. Let's uh, try to wrap up and get into the second chapter of the Innumerable Meanings Sutra. I'll just finish the first chapter here real quick. Uh, start with Daimoku. Nam myo ho renge kyo nam myo ho renge kyo nam myo ho renge kyo nam Thank you so much for continuing. Uh, this is our lecture series on the Lotus Sutra. And um, I'm just going to jump right into it because we have so much material to cover. Um, continuing from the first video. Those monks included great wisdom Shariputra, divine power Madhgalyayana, wisdom life Subhuti, Maha Katyayana, Mayatrayani's son Purna, Ajanata Kun, uh, <coughs> sorry, Kaundinya, Divine Eye Aniruda, Precept Keeping Upali, Attendant Ananda, the Buddha's cousin, uh, Buddha's son, Rahula, uh, Upananda, Revata, a whole list uh, of uh, notable students and scholars. There were 12,000 monks such as these. Uh, all were arhats, unconstrained by bondage of, or faults, free from attachments, and truly liberated. In other words, uh, he is surrounded by excellent students who had practiced enough at this point of all the previous teachings. Uh, they, they had understood uh, the difference between their human mind and their Buddha mind and could perceive with compassion the reality of all phenomena. At that time, magnificently adorned Bodhisattva, the Great One, realizing that everyone in the group was sitting in concentration, got up from his seat, went up to the Buddha, and with 80,000 Bodhisattva Great Ones in the assembly, prostrated himself at his feet, made processions around him a 100,000 times, scattered heavenly flowers, burned heavenly incense, and presented the Buddha with, wait for it, <laughs> with uh, heavenly robes, garlands, jewels of precious, uh, priceless uh, value that came rolling down from the sky and gathered on all sides in the clouds. Heavenly bins and bowls were filled with all sorts of heavenly delicacies, which satisfied people naturally just by their color and aroma. They placed heavenly banners Flags, canopies, and uh, musical instruments everywhere pleased the Buddha with heavenly music, then knelt with hands together before him, and in one voice wholeheartedly praised him in verse, saying, He is great, the great awakened one, the great holy Lord, in him there is no defilement, no contamination. Okay, so I'm not going to read that whole prose section. I'll let you do that. Um, what I want to make a point of here, and there's a lot of prose, and then we're going to jump right into the Dharma preaching chapter, again, in the Innumerable Meaning Sutra, which is the opening sutra to the Lotus. There's all these uh, fl <laughs> like the flowery descriptions just of all these hundreds of thousands of people and the circumnambulations around Buddha, blah, blah, blah. What you can envision in your mind when you read this kind of prose, especially about the uh, the prostrations and the circumnambulations, think of it this way: this is a sermon being developed, uh, uh, de well, developed and uh, delivered uh, by uh, Shakyamuni, and so uh, what he's actually saying is okay. Um, my whole purpose in this, in these lectures is to teach or to give you, as I said earlier, um, mental concepts to chew on so that you can gain the insights of your own Buddha mind. And here, as I'm thinking about how to do that, comes rushing in these ideas and questions that 
need to be addressed in order to fulfill the 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 largesse of what I'm trying to get you to perceive. Okay? So instead of using the words that I just used, I can I can replace largesse with the 80,000 monks who have achieved in, uh, liberation already uh, swirl around in my mind and deliver to me in prose uh, the following information or questions. You'll notice that all of the sutra uh, Although there there are moments of praise for the sutra itself for the for the because because as I said earlier the act of reciting or repeating or reading studying is a first person act that in fact invokes the very insight and enlightenment we're trying to gain. It's actually the method of enlightenment. Uh, and as we'll get to that later about repeating a single word or copying or writing or teaching as I'm doing right now is, I don't want to use that word, uh, is the act itself of clarifying the human mind and seeing clearly with the Buddha mind. It's, it's the act of of, uh, as Nietzsche would say, single-mindedly uh, seeking the Buddha or the company of or the union of the Buddha mind, okay? So this is one of the big motivators for me is that this is my practice that so this enables me to attain awakening enlightenment even as I am trying to communicate with my human frail f faults and all of uh, the enormous uh, enormity and, and and preciousness of this uh incredible insight okay so this is what he's putting into words it's not that there's all these people running around and falling flat and put it's it's the thought process that he's putting into words so he can enjoin you in the largesse of this information that he's delivering Follow me? All right. So now we get to the Dharma preaching. At that time, magnificently adorned Bodhisattva, the great one with the 80,000 Bodhisattva, great, we're still in this ceremony, right? Finished praising the Buddha with this verse and said to him, in union, 80,000, like a whole football stadium, says, world honored one, we, an assembly of 80,000 bodhisattvas, now want to ask you about the Tathagata's Dharma, but wonder whether the world-honored one will hear us or not. <laughs> How could he not, right? The Buddha said to magnificently adorned bodhisattva and the 80,000 bodhisattvas, Good, good, you have known well, good sons, that this is the time. What would you like to ask? Before long, the Tathagata will enter complete nirvana. After nirvana, no one will have any doubts. What is your question? I will answer it. Now, in the format, like in other translations, obviously this has been simplified, there's this formal asking of the question three times in three slightly different ways. And then the Buddha goes, oh, okay, I'll take you seriously and I'll answer now. Right? That's the, 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 the formal format of this whole ceremony. Uh, you can imagine if this, if the learning of this practice is constant repetition, then repeating something three times about repeating something three times is going to stick in your mind. Not the repetition, but the question. And repeating it three different ways also isolates some subtleties of the question itself. So everything's a device, you see. All right. Um, the magnificently adorned Bodhisattva with the 80,000 Bodhisattva said to the Buddha in unison again. They're really good at this. World honored one, if Bodhisattva great ones want to attain supreme awakening quickly, what gateway to the Dharma should they use? What gateway to the Dharma leads Bodhisattva Great Ones 
to attain supreme awakening quickly. The words are well chosen, and there are different versions and different translations, uh, but there's a lot of specificity. It doesn't, how do I gain enlightenment? How do I awaken? Um, this is because over the 40 some years of his teaching previously, uh, Shakyamuni taught awakening again, as I said before, in stages. And, uh, one of the things that, uh, Mahayana teachings, his later teachings, uh, really, really point out is that early in his early students had a tendency to just seize upon the words. How could they not in a way their, their whole teaching practice is repetition of the words and see the danger in that is that they got stuck on the words. They, they started thinking of the words like they were magical formulas that if they just repeated the words enough, they would attain enlightenment. There's some merit to that, and that, that doesn't go away in the entire practice. In fact, that's why we chant Namu Myoho Renge Kyo, Myoho Renge Kyo being uh, the Japanese phonetic of uh, Sadharma Pundarika, right? The, the Loro Sutra itself, the title of it and the title of every chapter. Um, so there's still a lot of attachment to the words, but what... What Shakyamuni took great pains to try to explain, if you read some of the early Mahayana texts like the Lankavatara Sutra uh, and others, he, he makes clear, that, look, don't get stuck on the words, the, the actual characters, get stuck, get the meaning of the words. In other words, it's not the spelling and the actual letters of the words that are doing the work. It's your conceptualization of what the word means. Look for the insight. Look for the value in what it's pointing to. Remember, uh, Bruce Lee, if you were ever in the martial arts, quoted one of the, uh, one of the Buddhist sermons, part of it, uh, when he said, you know, when you, when you, when somebody points out the moon in the sky so that you can see the, the glory of the moon in, in the heavens, uh, and all you do is look at the finger, you will not understand and you will miss all of that heavenly glory. Uh, this is in so many words what the Buddha was saying, what not Shakyamuni was saying. Stop staring at the finger and look at what the finger is pointing out. The words are like fingers, okay? So uh, there became a lot of early cults of the finger, if you will, cults of the word. And um, unfortunately, even though they, they progressed even doing that, because the, the truth is the truth, um, they became stuck in, and, um, and, and, and would achieve, they would achieve some awakening. I mean, you're going to, the minute you start practicing Buddhism, you're going to get aha moments, right? But it's incomplete. It's not fulfilled. You haven't really grabbed the large yes, the word I keep using, of the, 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 the amazing wonder of the complete enlightened mind of Buddha. Okay? So, uh, that's why you hear all of these adjectives, the, when they say, um, uh, what is the gateway to the, attain supreme awakening or, or, uh, uh, and also supreme awakening quickly because it wasn't until the, the Mahayana really that, um, uh, the awakening and the Buddha mind was firmly placed in the now, not in few 16 million lifetimes and blah, 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 blah. We'll get to that. But, um, but that Buddhahood, your Buddha mind, it's right now. You just need to reveal it. You need to awaken to it. All right. Enough on that. Um, the, 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 the Buddha said to magnificently adorned Bodhisattva and the 80,000 Bodhisattvas, uh, good sons, there is a unique gateway to the Dharma that leads Bodhisattvas to attain supreme awakening quickly. If a Bodhisattva learns this gateway to the Dharma, he will attain supreme enlightenment. Oh boy, here it is, right? World Honored One, what is this gateway to the Dharma called? What does it mean? How does a Bodhisattva practice it? Couldn't be any plainer of a question, right? 
The Buddha replied, good sons, this unique gateway to the Dharma is called innumerable meanings. A bodhisattva who wants to practice and study the gateway to the Dharma of innumerable meanings should observe that all things were originally, will be, and are in themselves empty and tranquil in nature and character not large or small, not subject to a rising or extinction, not fixed or movable, and neither advancing nor retreating. Like empty space, they are non-dualistic. Wham! What the heck does that all mean? And this is why, as I said when we started, the Lotus Sutra assumes the knowledge gained of all the previous teachings. Because when Shakyamuni drops terms like, well, or even in this, excuse me, translation, empty space, non-dualistic, or emptiness, or tranquil, um, this goes back to the very first teaching and the teachings of great scholarship from Nagarjuna and uh, Tendai and uh, uh, Vasubandhu uh, all of them wrote great treatises and commentaries about these things about the nature of no nature about the um, and here I'm going to caution you about something because the Hinayanists, uh, like the Theravada sects and, and other sects that are Hinayana that study the early teachings, this is the big stumbling block they have uh, to accept Mahayana teaching. Uh, there's uh, a lot of information out there uh, in, in monks and teachers spreading this misinformation that uh, that Buddhism is about non-self, about accepting that the self is a construct of the mind, and that there that that the work that we do is to understand that there really isn't a self, that there is no, no self, uh, no soul, no self, no creator, God, no, and and see this. This can easily lead to nihilism. That's why a lot of people think that Buddhism is about nothingness. The void. No, the void, again, another word that converts to nothing. That, that, that there is no me, that I don't exist. Um, and that's a very, very deeply flawed perception. Uh, and this, if you read any Mahayana, Text any early, uh, you know, when when, when uh, Shakyamuni was probably, I don't know, I'm guessing now, but this is going to be uh, several, maybe a decade into his teaching life. Um, he he saw this and uh, he started really admonishing uh, those. Uh, and it started with his own cu uh, cousin, Ananda, or was it Rahula? Anyway, people close to Shakyamuni had attained this level of Arhat, or Pratyaka Buddha, or even Sravakas, uh, the, the world of learning, or the world of, of uh, realization. Uh, but uh, especially Arhat, he really came down on them. Because... Those evolved students got to a point where they they were attaining this idea that uh, they were completely detached, that they weren't attached to the idea of I or mine or self anymore, and that uh, death, you know, death was not a, a concern for them. Uh, but there's a problem with that thinking, especially with the last statement I just made. Nothing confirms the existence of a thing more than confirming the non-thing. 
How many times have you heard somebody say, I'm not angry? <laughs> really? <laughs> Nothing confirms anger more than somebody who screams at you that they're not angry. Okay. <laughs> this is the same thing with self and known self. No self. The the if you read carefully, what is actually said is that there is no self nature. There is no pervasive permanent phenomena of self. But, and that is emptiness. In other words, realizing that everything is a conjured impermanent experience. Not that it doesn't exist, but that it doesn't exist per se. In other words, to say it another way, it is not that one should understand no self as much as one should understand that the self was never there to begin with. Unborn would be a more, and you'll see that term used as well. And if you, if you ever watch the movie The Matrix, they kind of, they touch, they use this concept for the whole movie, that we're living in a program. Well, the program is samsara. It's the conditioned mind. It's our human mind that just wants to make distinctions between this and that. Self and other. Me and you. That, this. This is not that. That is not this. You hear the negation again? The negation of something proves the something. This is a device of the human mind, the monkeys. The reality is that all of this is just an ex a momentary experience followed by an identical moment that is only identical because we persist on craving permanence in things. That in this next moment, everything could be completely different, but we don't want it to be. Our cravings, our desires are for this to be this and that to be that. And so from one moment to the next, that same energy creates an inertia and follows. But guess what? Over time, our cravings just can't keep it up. Right? So look up uh, the word entropy. There is nothing, no matter how determined it is to continue, that doesn't slowly decay. Look at the human life. The whole reason that we're born is from a tremendous amount of inertia of energy that wants to be. What is being? Being is separation. It's, it's identification. It's this and that. Me and you. Self, other. So it happens. And for the rest of our life, our self-other energy manifests and then starts to dis uh, dissolve. Right? This is Buddhism. So it's not that there's no self, because the self to begin with is an idea. It's a thought. It's a concept that we experience and it wears out but the truth is that experience is a moment to moment thing it's nothing permanent it it we didn't take a dash of this and a dash of that and create another this it's like an idea that's why you heard a lot in uh in the last century about Life is a dream. You could look at it that way if that works for you. But, you know, if I take a knife and I cut my arm, I, I, I experience bleeding and a cut arm. It's not fantasy dreaming. It's dreaming with consequences, if you will. 
because we're so inexorably attached to thingness that we make it a real experience. And if it's real, then it has to have consequences. And those consequences are self-manifested. That is the whole point. Suffering precipitates from our fanatical attachment to permanence, to wanting to keep things real. Make sense? It'll, I'm going to keep repeating it because we're going to keep, Shakyamuni is going to keep repeating it. But I want you to kind of get that in your head early. This is what's happening. Like empty space. What have they discovered about empty space recently, by the way? A little science. They discovered that empty space has mass. How is that possible? That's because of quantum gravity. Things, it turns out, like minute, minute particles or waves, because they don't know what to be at that stage. It just can't. It's so minute. Energy, in other words, keeps manifesting and unmanifesting constantly. And so it leaves little traces of its mass. And therefore, empty space has so much mass, in fact, that it competes with gravity. And that's what is making our universe expand. Chew on that. Look it up. It's very interesting. Okay. All living beings, however, make delusory distinctions weighing uh weighing whether something is this or that <laughs> sam used the same words whether it is gain or loss bad thoughts come to them producing a variety of evil actions they transmigrate within the six states undergoing all kinds of suffering and harm from which they cannot escape during innumerable billions of eons seeing this clearly Bodhisattva great ones cultivate sympathy and show great kindness and compassion in the desire to extricate others from suffering. What's more, they penetrate deeply into all things. In accord with the character of Dharma, all things emerge. In accord with the character of Dharma, all things live, experience, and in accord with the character of Dharma, all things change. In accord with the character of Dharma, all things perish. In accord with the character of Dharma, bad things emerge. In accord with the character of Dharma, good things emerge, live, change, and perish. Bodhisattvas, observing these four modes and being thoroughly familiar with them from one end to the other, should next observe clearly that none of these things continues to live even for a moment, but emerges and perishes every moment, each emerging, living, changing, and perishing in an instant. I guess I could have just read that paragraph, right? That I pre-interpreted it. So there you have it. Ask questions about that. We'll talk some more. But that right there, that is the core of the insight of Buddhism. So if you have the copy of this book, reread that. Chant, meditate, read that. Read it again. Chant, meditate, read it. Because that's it. After seeing this, the abilities, natures, and desires of living beings can be seen. See, once you're objective about it, you can understand, uh, obviously, you know, we can always see what other people's behavior are like. Oh, he's going to do that again. Oh, that's her. Yep, watch, she'll say this. Next. See, there she goes saying, we can, we can tell how other people function. We can see their karma. But damned if it's hard to see our own. <laughs> We're the same way. We're the same thing. Awakening is kind of like figuring that out. Awakening is like seeing us and our conditions so clearly that when we look around and see others, we see ourselves. That's the oneness. That's the perception that, 
Oh my God, we're all just doing the same thing. We're the same. We're the, exactly the same. The innumerable meanings emerge from one Dharma. This one Dharma is characterless. Accordingly, this characterless manifests all characters. Neither having character nor being characterless is called true character. Now there's that, that conundrum again. It's, it's not that there is or isn't. It's that the is and isn't isn't. It's <laughs> starting to sound like I'm writing koans. <laughs> well, anyway, I'll let it. I can't say it any better than that. <laughs> Not yet, anyway. Maybe someday. The compassion that Bodhisattva Great Ones display after dwelling at peace in this true character of reality is clear and not in vain. Not in vain, of course, because the self ceases to possess your energy, your that that selfness is uh it's no longer a character because your character when you fully release is of strict observation of the whole. You are the whole in the whole and the whole. You're just energy. This is why the Resting state, the what I call the quiescent energy, is the basis of everything. It's only that certain energies coalesce, skandhas, to manifest and then dissipate back into the quiescence. I got ahead of myself. <clears throat> They are truly capable of relieving living beings from suffering. Having given them release from suffering, suffering, they teach the Dharma again, delighting all living beings. Good sons. If a Bodhisattva practices well the gateway to the Dharma of innumerable meanings in this way, the Bodhisattva will for certain attain supreme awakening soon. Well, soon is and quickly are again from the concept that it's already there. So if you wake into it now, that's pretty quick. You don't have to wait. Good son, such a profound and unexcelled great vehicle sutra of innumerable meanings is truly correct in logic, unsurpassed in value, and protected by the Buddhas of the past, present, and future. A host of demonic ways cannot damage it, nor can any wrong view of life and death defeat or destroy it. Therefore, good sons of Bodhisattva, great ones, if you want to attain unexcelled awakening quickly, you should practice and study profound, unexcelled, great vehicle sutra of innumerable meanings. At that time, magnificently adorned Bodhisattva spoke once again to the Buddha. Quote, world-honored one, the Dharma preached by the world-honored one is inconceivable. The ability and nature of living beings is also inconceivable. And the gateway to the Dharma of emancipation is also inconceivable. Though we no longer have doubts about any of the Dharma preached by the Buddha, out of fear that various living beings will be perplexed, we repeatedly ask the world-honored one about it. For the more than 40 years since the Tathagata attained the way, for the sake of the living you have continued to preach, the meaning of the four modes of all things, the meaning of suffering, the meaning of emptiness, the meaning of impermanence, of no enduring self, the absence of greatness, the absence of pettiness, non-arising, non-extinction, one character, absence of character, dharma nature, dharma character, being originally empty and quiet, non-coming, non-going, non-appearing, and non-disappearing. This is what we've been talking about, right? Those who have heard it have obtained the warm dharma, the highest dharma, the best dharma in the world. They have obtained fruits of a stream enterer, fruits of being a once-returner, 
fruits of being a non-returner, fruits of being an arhat, and the pratyakabuddha way. They have aspired to become awakened. They have ascended the first stage, the second stage, and the third stage, and reached the tenth stage. In what sense is what you preached in the past, the meaning of all the Buddhas, different from what you preach today? One hears that if bodhisattvas practice only the profound and unexcelled great vehicle sutra of innumerable meanings, without fail they will soon attain unexcelled awakening. Is that true? Please, world honored one, out of the compassion and pity for all, analyze this for the sake of living beings everywhere and leave no doubt in the minds of all those <clears throat> in the present and future who hear the Dharma. So they still have doubts. Then the Buddha said to great adornment Bodhisattva, good, 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 great good son, you have raised good questions for the Tathagata about the subtle and wonderful meanings of the profound and unexcelled great vehicle. Again, this is a conversation Buddha, the Shakyamuni is having in his own mind, and he's saying, I haven't explained this fully yet. I still have a look of perplexed uh, wonder in my students. You should know that you will greatly enrich many pleasing human and heavenly beings and re relieving living beings from suffering. This is the truth of great compassion, a truth that is not in vain. For this reason, you will surely and quickly attain unexcelled awakening. You will also enable all living beings in the present and future to accomplish unexcelled awakening. What What is he talking about? This, this is the big difference of Mahayana I was alluding to earlier that the Hinayana don't get. Is that in order to have fully experienced enlightenment at its at its full, you can't practice selfishly to an, awaken yourself without awakening your environment. You have to work to help others awaken. This is the way we truly discover the depth of our own experience, our own life. How many examples do you need in life that you learn just in samsara, just samsaric reality, forget Buddhism for a minute, Anything you learn in life is a result of rubbing up against others. I don't mean physically. I just, I'm mentally. What we call teachers, what we call students, what we call teaching and learning happening in our own heads. Love, anger, relationships, all of the emotions, they all occur as a result of relations. So how could you possibly attain a completely full unexcelled enlightenment extricating yourself from everyone else that's flawed that's only that's a small yes you'll learn a lot you'll see a lot but you won't fully discover the complete release of bodhisattva it's the buddha the buddha way we seek the buddha mind we seek and only through bodhisattva practice not Pratyaka Buddha, not Shravaka, not Arhat. Only through Bodhisattva practice in assisting others do we, A, learn what we really know, B, learn what we don't know, and C, learn the true nature of all phenomena, not just our self, not self. Follow? So here I, I circled this next paragraph. Good sons, after sitting upright for six years under the Bodhi tree at the place of the way, I could attain supreme awakening. With the eyes of a Buddha, I could understand that not all the teachings could be proclaimed. Why was that? I knew that the natures and the desires of living beings were not the same as their natures and their desires were not the same, I taught the Dharma in various ways. 
I use the power of skillful means to teach the Dharma in various ways, and after more than forty years, the truth has not yet been revealed. This is why there are differences in the way living beings take the way and why they do not attain to unexcelled awakening quickly. This is where the Lotus Sutra, and this is the preamble of the Lotus Sutra, this is where he, he comes back to this popular refrain from earlier Mahayana teachings that, listen up, Hinayanas, and early, the people I've taught for 40 years, that you don't have the complete picture yet. You're good students. He keeps calling them good sons. But listen, good sons, the Dharma is like water that washes away dirt. Just as the water in a well, a pond, a stream, a river, a valley, a ditch, or a great sea is equally effective in washing away all kinds of dirt, so Dharma water effectively washes away the filth that afflicts living beings. Good sons, the nature of water is the same, but a stream, a river, a well, a pond, a valley, stream, ditch, and a great sea are distinct and different from each other. The nature of the Dharma is like this. There is equal effectiveness and no differentiation in washing away the waste of afflictions, but the three teachings, the four fruits, and the two ways are not one in the same. Good sons, though the water washes equally well, a well is not a pond. A pond is not a stream or a river, and a valley stream or a ditch is not a sea. Just as the Tathagata, the world's hero, is free in the Dharma, all of the teachings in this, in his sermons are like this. Though early, middle, and late teachings equally wash away the delusions of living beings, the beginning is not the middle, and the middle is not the end. Teaching at the beginning, in the middle, and at the end are the same in expression, but different in meaning. Meaning, meaning, meaning. Good sons, after leaving the king of trees, when I turned the Dharma wheel of the four truths for the five men at Deer Park in Varanasi, Ajnata, Kwandinya, and the others, I taught that all things are originally empty and calm, ceaselessly changing, arising, and perishing in an instant. I'm going to have to stop this before I get cut off like I did the last video. When I spoke in various places during the middle period, proclaiming the twelve causes and conditions and the six transcendental practices for months, monks, and the groups of bodhisattvas, I also taught that all things are originally empty and calm, ceaselessly changing, arising and perishing in an instant. Now, preaching the great vehicle sutra of innumerable meanings, I also teach that all things are originally empty and calm, ceaselessly changing, arising and perishing in an instant. Good sons, this is why the teaching at the beginning, in the middle, and in the end are the same in expression but different in meaning. Since the meaning is different, so too the understandings of living beings differ. And since understandings differ, so too attainments of the Dharma, of its fruits, and of the way differ. And we're going to get into that difference in the next video. Sorry. <laughs> Leave that little hook in there. And uh, we're going to close this second video. And I'm going to take a break, and uh, then we'll get right back into it. I so appreciate you participating in this. I hope I'm providing you some insights. Please, please comment if I'm being confusing about anything, if I'm being too repetitive. Let me know. Let me know your thoughts. I'm doing this to help you. So, you know, guide me. Um, and I'll close with Sancho by Moku. Nam Myo Ho Renge Kyo Nam 
Thank you very much. And I'll see you soon. Stop by.